Hello everyone, welcome to the talk on compute intensive uh, data applications. Uh, so a bit of history for me, uh, about me. I have more than nine plus years of experience and I'm right now working with uh, uh, with Exadatum Software Services as, as the big data architect. Uh, I have experience working on domains like uh, BFSI, e-commerce, ad serving with companies like Snapdeal, Pubmatic and Schlumberger. For the past uh, one and a half years, my uh, my technical journey has taken a shift towards kind of uh, developing infrastructure, primarily for, for the use cases which talk about uh, running data science applications. For example, how, how, we, we should, how we can run the TensorFlow and how we can have the GPU enabled TensorFlow running and dynamic scheduling and all. So that's a bit of a background for me. Uh, in the agenda for the talk is that I'm going to take you through a, a journey uh, where I'm going to introduce a use case which we are handling right now which is primarily a data engineering and a data science mixed kind of a use case. And how, I will be talking about how we used to do it like uh, eight, nine months back and what were the issues with that strategy. And then I will talk about how we, re, how we uh, slowly re-strategized ourselves and move towards running something on DCOS. Uh, few positives, negatives, what are the improvements we are thinking on right now to improve, how to improve our system. What is the aim we want to achieve, I will talk about that as well. Uh, about uh, uh, achieving the aim as well, as well as I have few demos for you just to make you comfortable that yes, what I'm saying is, is that simple. So our use case, as I said, is primarily data engineering and data science use case. Uh, data engineering, we have Hadoop jobs, uh, we have Spark jobs, we have Kafka for doing ingestion. Pretty, pretty simple and standard pipeline. Uh, for data science, we, we had our scripts written, so more, more on the BA side, so we have people who are like, uh, who are kind of in the role of BA, so they primarily write these uh, R scripts, and we have few uh, data scientists who write uh, these TensorFlow jobs. And how we try to solve the whole situation where both, both the systems can run together is basically thinking about running big data applications into containers. Now, uh, running big data applications into containers is something uh, like a kind of an overhead as as communicated by few of my colleagues especially when we when we talk about systems like Hadoop or Spark who require where they talk about horizontal scalability you you can add the nodes and you can run the applications but uh, I think uh, after the next slide maybe we, I will be making more sense when I talk about uh, doing containerization for them as well so our client is is, is an e-commerce giant and uh, the data size what we are handling right now is approximately 55 GB per hour and it is traditionally a company who has DE and DS. So uh, earlier what used to happen was as, as, the data, as, the, as an e-commerce giant we have the use cases in data science as uh, collaborative filtering and logistic regressions and finding out that what exactly is the sale with respect to the way the, uh, way the price of a product is uh, getting changed. But now the thing is that with the size, with the size increasing every day uh, and complex user, pa user patterns coming into picture, uh, our data engineering pipelines uh, are becoming more and more complex. And along with that, we wanted to have a look into the deep learning use cases as well. So we wanted to leverage TensorFlow. So uh, this is kind of that six, uh, I mean, this is the picture which was like six months back. We have various sources. We had uh, written a simple Java Spring based REST client. So these sources basically hit hit uh, our REST client with the data, which is primarily in JSON format. The data gets through Kafka and gets to Flume uh, and gets ingested into HDFS. So Kafka for those kind of system where SLA is not that primary concern, but Flume is kind of pushing the data through your system. Uh, for example, placing an order or finding out, error, uh, basically uh, identifying the use cases for fraud detection and also for those couple of small use cases we were using Flume as well. And for the rest of them, for example, the user clicks, uh, uh, viewing of the product and these kind of scenarios, we are, we are primarily using Kafka. We are ingesting that into HDFS and from there, as I said, we have Hadoop and Spark jobs which process the data, put the data, so basically they do filtering and sampling and all those kind of things and then they finally put the data into GCS. Uh, and from there we have a Kubernetes cluster. So basically we have a basic Kubernetes cluster running and we have the Docker images being created for each of the environments. Like if our BA wants to basically run an R script, we, we have the provision of uh, spawning a container which, which is apt to basically taking care of that R script. 
And once the execution finishes, uh, we had written a, com a complete job kind of a script, which keeps on checking periodically that whatever pod has finished, it simply kills that. So our cluster grows in size and it comes back. And mind you, this whole infrastructure is right now running on Google Cloud Platform. So uh, with, the, with this Kubernetes kind of an infrastructure on Google Cloud Platform, uh, there is, there is something known as a concept of preemptible nodes and all, where if you have those preemptible nodes, the condition is that they will go away after 24 hours. But the price associated is just one third of your actual node. So that those kind of nodes are not, uh, not proper when we talk about running Spark applications, but when we talk about running certain burst of applications, like uh, people firing 100 R scripts together, I think that kind of an infrastructure can work, which, which runs for maybe 15, 20 minutes and goes away. A bit more on, on the size, on the, on the infra, which, what we were using. So the event which, which, which we are ingesting is close to 1,500 events per second, which uh, looking at 1,600 to 700 KB, it comes out to be somewhere around 50, 55 GB per hour. The rest layer, we have 10 nodes right now, uh, 25 nodes for Kafka. So how, how we do is that uh, even if, let's say, we, have, uh, we are trying to do, let's say, a task A, and we want the data to be processed from stage 1 to stage 2, if anything fails, we try to save the state into a Kafka job so that we can again go ahead and reschedule that re reschedule that task again. So that is the reason why we have kind of <coughs> a lot of Kafka uh, Kafka brokers running. Uh, as I said, Flume is just a very small use case uh, for for a couple of use cases where we have kind of an SLA needs to be met. Immediate processing is required. We are using Flume, so it is pretty small at that point of time. And for running for running my Spark and Hadoop jobs, uh, as I said, we were using GCP. So in GCP the managed uh, Spark and Hadoop distribution uh, environment is your data proc, and we were close to 100 uh, nodes there. For the Kubernetes, we have two, two bare minimum nodes, so two nodes where like our complete job script was running, uh, uh, and two nodes were running for running all those uh, housekeeping uh, tasks uh, containers. Apart from that, everything was kind of scalable in terms of preemptible machines. And it kind of, uh, the way we were firing the jobs, uh, the, the amount, the, bi the bigger that, I mean, it was a big team in terms of, from the BA side as well as the data scientists. So uh, at an average, uh, normally it goes around around 100 to 120, uh, to be frank, because uh, at that point of time, we were not uh, doing the, uh, we were not assigning proper sizes to the containers and all. So there was a bit of mismatch at that point of time. But if I just refer to the number, it was close to 100 to 120 in PCAS, kind of. Now, uh, here I want to mention one uh, one paradigm shift, kind of. So, I think my journey with Hadoop started four years back, and at that point of time, we were we were kind of really thrilled when looking at a system that, if you want to increase the infrastructure, all you have to go and add a couple of nodes to it, and it will scale up, right? Uh, on the same line, Spark came, it br bring that in-memory thing, it became fast. But how the things are right now is that uh, but then again, in the previous in the previous two scenarios, you are anyways bound by the infrastructure. Let's say if there is a requirement where you require 500 nodes, not may, maybe not for the complete 24 hours, but maybe just for one hour, you need 500 nodes. So what will happen in the original uh, in the previous scenario is where you need horizontal scalability uh, to be kind of increased manually, the number of nodes increased manually. There we need to go and we need to increase the number of nodes. But with we cannot expect the data scientists or the people who are running the job to go and provision maybe five nodes for them and then go ahead and do the processing, right? Uh, along with that, uh, with these Spark jobs and the Hadoop jobs, how were, how were they kind of uh, uh, planned was that they were catering to the maximum size. So let's say if I have an SLA to meet, maybe processing the complete uh, performing the complete processing in one hour and in the peak time if I require 100 nodes so we normally schedule 100 nodes and let it be like that even in the non-peak hours where you are you are paying for the infrastructure but like not utilizing the infrastructure completely. So the DevOps team which was there five to six months back was uh, four in number and we have a lot of software components as I said we were using Kafka, we were using Spark, we were using Azkaban for triggering the for scheduling my, our Spark jobs we had Hadoop, Flume, Kubernetes, Jenkins, a lot of things happening. Uh, approximately 125 Kafka topics, 93 Spark jobs to be frank. Uh, different teams sharing the infrastructure as well. And the basic, the basic problem was that we need to meet the SLAs. Uh, 
with the with the aim of optimizing the cost as well. So if you see, uh, this was kind of an infrastructure what we used to have. We had like three nodes for Flume. Uh, we had Kafka on 25. We have Jenkins maybe sitting on one machine, 100 for Spark, two nodes initially for Kubernetes, right? And they are kind of, uh, they are kind of provisioned, for example, the Spark machines, Spark cluster specifically is kind of provisioned to meet that peak R SLA, right? So, so the thing was that even in the non-peak hours, the complete resources which were there, which was there on the Spark cluster was kind of underutilized. As and this is true for all of them. I mean, I agree that with Flume, the infrastructure loss, I mean, the money involved is pretty less. But then again, if we can optimize on that as well, it will be it will be good for us. Ideally speaking, what we wanted is that instead of treating each and every component as a as a separate resource group as a separate, I mean, applications requiring separate infrastructure, we wanted to have something like this kind of an infrastructure, where each or each and every applications are nothing but just the applications. So within this complete infrastructure, if there is a requirement for my Spark job to use maybe, let's say, 100 nodes, uh, a capacity parallel to 100 nodes, it should have the capability to do that. And as I said, we have a data science, uh, data science use case as well. So in the non-peak hours, we, we wanted to schedule the training of the models. So in the non-peak hours, when the Spark cluster and everything is kind of free, at in, in, the, in those hours only, we are going to kind of uh, do the model training of our uh, for our, for our uh, data science jobs. So with that particular aim to utilize the infrastructure and in talking in terms of infinite scalability whenever it is required, our first choice was to move completely to Kubernetes. Right, so we, we, and why it was our first choice? Because anyways our infrastructure was, uh, we had decent experience on Kubernetes. We were already creating the images in Google, Google, con, uh, Google Container Registry. We have decent experience of handling Kubernetes as well. Uh, we could have gone ahead and containerized every application uh, via Kubernetes, but there was something, there were a few points missing. Uh, we wanted to have a few, couple of more things to be covered up with this uh, shift. So few points which we wanted to have is like deployment should not be able to tie to a particular cloud provider. Now, how many of us had used Kubernetes? May I have the hands up please? How many have used Kubernetes? Is your, is your Kubernetes running out of, uh, I mean, is it running on Google Cloud Platform or some in some other environment? Anybody who is running Kubernetes outside GCP? And that is the pain point. That is exactly the thing. Now, Kubernetes being the baby of Google, they had decorated it in a, in a they had decorated that beautifully. You, you, it looks good when I talk about the preemptible nodes, uh, taking one third of the money and all, but those facilities are only available with, uh, with GCP. If you try to install Kubernetes, let's say on on-prem, the pain points are, the pain points are big. And if you see, if you try to search that on Google, there will be just few blogs who talk about it. Right, so people are not doing that kind of a thing. So we wanted to, we don't, we didn't wanted to tie tie ourselves with with Kubernetes and Gu and Google Cloud Platform. To be frank, we have the aim of once the applications get stabilized, we have the aim of actually moving to on-premise things, especially uh, those kind of applications which does not require this uh, certain burst of uh, resource usage, uh, who don't have a requirement of certain certain resource usage uh, burst in the resource. So <clears throat> that was the next. Uh, along with that, we want we don't wanted to compromise on uh, adding new uh, adding new components. So easy addition of new components is also something what we are targeting, and this becomes very important when we talk about uh, hosting our infrastructure on on-prem. Right? It it is simple to use uh, Amazon and use its product, but it it is difficult to have them like cross platforms. And frankly speaking, uh, if you go ahead and search uh, running Hadoop on Kubernetes, you will not find any example. I mean, just one example, I mean, very small example here and there, but not nothing like that. And we wanted to have our uh, production pipelines of Hadoop being running on, on Kubernetes. So that is again kind of a negative point against Kubernetes in our case. So Kubernetes looked prim promising and initially, and as I said, it looks very easy on GCP. It takes 
maybe not not more than a minute to spawn. Uh, it it uh, the uh, the size of the cluster increases flawlessly. It comes down pretty well. But the thing is that what out what if I don't want to use GCP? Right. So in short, uh, installing big data components. So our aim was just not looking into into the big uh, the the applications which are like which are cust which are which are uh, kind of perfect fit for containerization right when we talk about applications which which have to transfer a lot of data across the containers i don't think uh, those kind of applications kind of scale that that well if you have proper uh, if if you try to run spark job on complete containers it it is not going to give you that complete uh, performance as such when you have that running proper on, on actual machines so and the thing is that either to talk about Kafka, Spark, or Hadoop, they all have that same nature. So uh, installing those big data components, especially the data engineering side, was difficult. Now, not enough support available. So if you just go to that uh, Spark 2.3.1 version, which is kind of uh, released last month, they just talk about a single example on Kubernetes, right? And if you talk about the previous version. There they talked about Kubernetes, and for the next one and a half years, there was there was complete uh, silence, right? So it was not it was not happening properly. Uh, your Spark is not inherently built for running into those kind of applications. Uh, for TensorFlow, as as we were targeting, so uh, we, we we wanted to use TensorFlow, and we were using started using TensorFlow for running deep learning use cases, and the the. And like five, six months back when we started with developing of this infrastructure, at that point of time, uh, the GPU support for Kubernetes was in alpha phase. So they had kind of said that uh, don't use it into production. And that, that is something we wanted to achieve. And if you talk in the current, current scenario, we have few very good libraries which support this data parallelism and model parallelism and deep learning. Uh, like we have a library Kubeflow which is picking up these days. But talking about five, six months back, these were not present. So it was very difficult to run your models and train them properly using these parallelism mechanism, parallel uh, approaches. And with the as well as the logging thing. So uh, each of the pods have their logs, but it is difficult to basically uh, pull all the logs at one place and go ahead with uh, go ahead with doing the processing. So that was also missing. So I'm not saying again that no. So it is not that I'm not. Advocating that the components cannot be installed on Kubernetes, it can. They cannot be installed on Kubernetes. They can, but the thing is that the amount of effort with Kubernetes and not GCP is huge. So how we how we solved it is that we we have uh, Marathon and Kubernetes uh, as the orchestration uh, orchestration engines engines, and before below that we 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 started using Mesosphere DCOS. So DCOS. Uh, as it will come in the next slide, uh, it is nothing but an operating system. So, how are op how when we talk about an operating system on my machine, it's an operating system which was which basically takes various processes and it gives you a feel that all of them are like one, right? So you can use your different applications can run on different uh, cores and they produce the result. With DCOS, the only uh, the only difference is that don't talk about process. You have multiple nodes. And you have a one big pool of resources together. So for this machine, I have four processes. Similarly, if I have multiple machines, just add all the cores together, and that is your DCOS capabilities. So why we why we started looking into this is because big data ecosystem components like uh, Kafka, Hadoop, and Spark was kind of one click deployment. It just if you you click one and you can you are good to go. It has very good logging framework which was missing with Kubernetes. Uh, uh, we were using Kubernetes. We had done a lot of work in Kubernetes, and uh, thankfully, uh, DCOS also supports Kubernetes to be the orchestration manager. So we have a case where our whole pipeline could have moved uh, as it is to to DCOS. So whatever work we had done, that can be reused, and deploying a distribu distributed TensorFlow application was was not that difficult here. So this is DCOS. It's a three-layered architecture. If you see the very top layer, it talks about the services and applications. So you deploy your service services and applications, and those services and applications basically pass through the middle layer, which is an operating system. And this operating system basically adds up all the resources which are lying in the uh, in the un, uh, in in the underlying nodes. So you have all the nodes here, 
you add all the resources and that will start pooling to the complete infrastructure which is available to your one operating system. Right, so here basically the, I, will, I will go it with the demo and my aim is to basically uh, show you that what all steps uh, at the basic level are required to have a DCOS cluster up and running. The infrastructure I'm going to use is Amazon. We, we have infrastructure as a code, written in Ansible. We will be using cloud, uh, cloud formation for that. Uh, first, I will show that how simple it is to spawn up for doing your POCs. And then I'm going to use that same infrastructure for, for the rest of the use cases as well. So, yeah. so we have uh, cloud formation templates already available and what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick North Virginia, I'm going to select that. The moment you select that and you have, you have the complete script ready for those uh, sample, de sample deployments, I'm going to use them, I select OK and it will kind of if you, if you just start looking into that script, this is kind of an infrastructure which you are maintaining. We have load balancers up front, we have one node which is acting as master, multiple nodes acting as private, and all the complete configuration being done here. We have elastic load balancer being uh, balancing the load and all. So if you want to have at least the very basic one, you don't need to do anything. You, you, you can go ahead with, with a click. I click next. I will put a, I will put the stack name here. I'm using M4X large for my deployment right now. Uh, the key name is DCOS. That is a key pair which I had created. Uh, I'm going to use one one big one M3 M4X as my master and five as as my slave. So there will be one master and six slaves running, uh, which is which is kind of going to go ahead, uh, which is going to appear in our on our DCOS console. Right, so this is this is the configuration we have. And we can kind of just go and create this. Right. It will it will start appearing here. So frankly I'd change the name in the morning. Um, yeah, so DCO has started appearing. The create is in progress. And uh, if you see these all are the things which are happening behind the scenes. So this whole thing has been managed by our by by our script, which which I was which we had used. So this will take couple of minutes. I mean, not couple of minutes to be frank. It will take around 12 to 13 minutes to kind of be up and running. And in the meanwhile, what I will do is I will just switch this off, and we will do a fast forward for those 10 minutes. Right. So now our our DCOS installation is kind of complete. Right, so it shows it is it, it is complete. Uh, we are going to access our DCOS web UI using the DNS address of our master. Right, and your DCOS web UI is all set. Right, so this is the dashboard page which talks about the CPU allocation. Since we had started fresh, there is nothing there. The memory allocation, the disk allocation. It says that it has six connected nodes right now and it has 38 components right now. So in short, my the script which we used, it has kind of 38 services kind of things running behind the scenes. No services configured right now. This is pretty, uh, is one of the major reason why we used. So they had certified the distributions like Cassandra is in the certified mode. They are ready for production. And we have use cases like Uber and Yelp and Cisco who are doing that. So these all are the certified ones. If you see, we, I got Kafka, I got Elasticsearch, and I got almost all the components which, were, which was required by, by our use case. 
configuring them configuring them pre pretty easy just click set the properties here and run the service so either you can use the ui or you can simply go ahead and put your json json configuration as well Similarly, I'm going to go ahead with Kubernetes as well. So it's just one click and I'm, we are done. Of course, you can, you can go ahead and configure uh, based on your requirements, but uh, the basic setup is, is done, right? The matrices has, had started coming up. If you see, they are rising right now, there are two tasks. Kubernetes is coming up, Elasticsearch is already up. And just, just remember this Elasticsearch component, I have, to inter, I have to tell you a very, very interesting fact about it. So uh, just keep Elasticsearch in mind. I will show that at, at the very last, that what I was talking about. Now, uh, with this, uh, so this was kind of a deployment, but how to access this, this, this infrastructure, right? So we have this up and running in within the nodes. Here I'm just trying to, I'm just using a simple Linux machine on my GCP and here I'm doing the very basic steps so that I get this as a bootstrap machine. Uh, uh, frankly speaking, they, this is nothing but parallel to the OAuth, config, OAuth mechanism I'm trying to configure. So this is complete OAuth thing which is getting configured. I get the OAuth token. I will put that there and now that machine can actually look into my system. All right, so pretty straightforward. There is kind of nothing much here uh, in terms of, in terms of uh, if you really want to go ahead with the basic, uh, basic setup. Of course, adding the, adding the nodes and all is anyway supported. You can, imp you can increase the nodes to 20, 50, 35, 45. The only complexity will start appearing when, when you want to have an altogether different flavor of things running behind the scenes, right? A different flavor of load balancer and all. There you have to primary, basically go ahead and manage the script, right? A bit of, a bit of uh, information about the adoption and the success stories of DCOS. So for the first six months of launch, there were 31,000 open DCOS clusters created, right? And this is kind of 3x more than what was expected by the community. And the best, the best part is that in that 60% uh, was on on-premise, all right? So if you can do anything on-premise, I think uh, it will more or less follow your cloud as well. And few companies who had kind of certified and who, and who have said that they had, they were able to reduce their infrastructure by 70% to be frank, from 100 to th just 30 there, if they require 100 nodes initially, now they just require 30. So this is something what, what, what's been said by Netflix and Yelp to be uh, to be precise, Uber Uber uses that so that uh, GPU thing which I was talking about with the TensorFlow Uber uh, Uber data science team actually heavily uses that that is available as use cases. Right. So what exactly are a couple of points? What is the heuristic to design our system when we have uh, when we have this uh, DCOS kind of an application running? So the heuristic is like M4X has four cores. So whatever container I'm trying to spawn from inside, it should be a factor of, of four, right? So if I use, let's say all the containers of size one core or all containers using just one core, then the complete machine will be utilized. But if let's say I use a container, if I try to create a Docker container of just three nodes, uh, sorry, three cores, then in that case, that one core will just uh, is kind of wasted. So that, that, with that particular uh, heuristic, uh, with that particular approach in mind that at any given point of time, my machine should be completely utilized all 100%, we have to design the compute as well as the memory usage for our containers. And the only trick in comparison to Kubernetes, so with, this is true for Kubernetes as well, and for both, the only trick is that how, how beautifully you place your, how beautifully you place your containers so that your machine uh, machine is completely utilized, right? So here I will just go 
and I will bring another use case where I'm going to use that same UI. I'm going to start with Spark application in front of you with just one clicks. Uh, I will show how simple it is to maybe run Kafka and I will run a TensorFlow job as well. Right, so here I just removed Kubernetes because my cluster is not that big with what I'm targeting to deploy. Uh, I will go to catalog, I will click on Spark and do in, and just install that. So I will be using 2.3 and with just a with just couple of clicks we are done. For performing the same thing on Kubernetes you have to kind of do a bit of a setup. It's not that uh, straightforward kind of a thing. Here I'm using the Docker image, which is provided by the DCOS containerizer, which is uh, which is primarily running on Hadoop 2.6 and Spark 2.3. Right? Spark will start appearing. Now, how difficult it is to actually just use the command line interfaces? It is it is pretty simple. I mean, just straightforward commands available in the documentation, and it and starts running. So we, we have the way to modify these configurations. So those are available. I'm just using the default configuration to show you, to present before you the ease with DCOS uh, and on-prem deployments. So it will come up. Right, so it is running now. What if I, I thought uh, whatever configuration we did, if I want to increase the size of it, right? It, from the UI, go ahead and modify the number of cores for it. The new size will be incorporated. So your Kafka will start accum utilizing a bigger infrastructure. Right, so I'm increasing the size of the brokers. I'm increasing the size from uh, the CPU used by one broker to two. And in total now I would be having Total infrastructure of four, four cores. Right, so it, it started adding, it, it showed that the infrastructure utilizes increased. Now, just from there, I opened a Spark UI, already configured. These were few of the applications which I tried to execute. One was launched, couple of driver code. That means if the Spark is, accept, expect, is accepting a Spark application, I think the configuration is okay. Otherwise, the daemon will simply reject. For running it, uh, nothing much difference. Uh, if you see the command, how I, I, I how I was able to do that? Uh, simple one, DCOS Spark uh, run. I'm submitting the applications with the arguments. Right, so nothing much uh, changing uh, changed in terms of uh, the commands or the approach we are using. No code changes required in my Spark application for this. Right. So now I will go ahead and basically deploy. A custom container, I will try to run a TensorFlow job. Uh, and for this, I will create a complete configuration. Right, so. Yeah. So I will just delete them. The work is over. I'm removing Spark and Kafka together because my, and I'm going to start with, so here the strategy is we can have single containers as well as multiple containers. 
Right now, I'm going to use a single container. Uh, if you see, this is my configuration which is required. It says that my ID is TensorFlow. The number of CPUs I'm going to use two. The number of GPUs is zero. Uh, memory is going to be 2048. So, what uh, what exactly we have to do if what exactly do we need to do if we want to leverage a GPU? So, all we have to do is that instead of using M4x large, we have to use the AMI, AMIs of Amazon where you have the GPUs available, and the GPUs you and then you can go ahead and utilize the GPUs. Right. And then the CLI which I configured from there, a straightforward DC, uh, Docker commands. I will go into that same container from here and uh, do a bit of updates because the Docker image which I am using is a bit old. Uh, it does not install the new Git version which I want to use. So I do a bit of that and I take a sample example available on the internet and I try to run it. This is going to be the exercise. My Python, my TensorFlow job will be executed. So again. No big thing be, things been done, but kind of you were able to see that within uh, within few minutes you have your infrastructure ready, which has Spark, Kafka, TensorFlow, and all ready. Right, I will just go and run this convolution neural net. Pretty simple example. There is nothing like a data science thing. Uh, I mean, it has a simple TensorFlow job running. It gets accepted. It normally takes 11 minutes to finish off with this infrastructure. Okay, so it will take a bit of time. It takes approximately 11 minutes. Right, so the infra gain we got after this for that particular infrastructure with that heuristic of properly placing the containers is kind of, uh, initially if you just sum up all the machines, if you sum up all the cores, there were kind of 900 cores which you are using at any given point of time, it reduced to 650. That means with a four core machine it was just 160 nodes and with very basic infrastructure and basic things being done correctly, at least we were able to get a gain of 28%. So without breaching the SLAs it was getting this much as well as the number of infrastructure infrastructure people since the deployment and all is pretty simple so the number of the number of people who who are required to actually manage the complete infrastructure or running running the pocs and all those are kind of reduced and the number of infrastructure uh, tickets being raised by the dev team or setup team is kind of almost the same and they are pretty pretty quick to handle in terms of code changes, so there is no code change required. No code change in Spark if you want to run it on DCOS. It's all from outside. You have to properly configure the jars and all. Fire the proper command and it will execute. When we talk about running Kafka and all, so what we did was that we had scripts like Kafka. If you want to run a console producer on Kafka, you have Kafka console producer.sh. What we did was we created a custom console producer.sh for our use case and whatever command, whatever changes in the commands was required, it was be hidden behind it. So for developers, it was kind of more or less the same. For developing this infrastructure, a team of around four people took around 2.5 months to successfully deploy the Spark job. So as the very first thing, we, we uh, targeted only on Spark jobs and we converted them using this infrastructure. Now, what we are doing right now is we are, so right now, as I said, we, we are using Marathon, the inbuilt uh, inbuilt Google uh, orchestra uh, orchestration engine, but we, we have the aim of actually utilizing Kubernetes as well. So we are kind of doing study for that. Along with that, the library, which is Kubeflow, which gives the capability of model parallelism and data parallelism for GPU, uh, GPU jobs. Uh, we are utilizing, we are kind of doing POCs for that. 
as well as the TensorFlow is right now available out of the box again in the beta version. So we are evaluating that as well. So that's pretty much it from my side. I'm open to questions now. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, I was uh, just interested to know uh, how are you managing the storage part? Uh, I see the compute part, what you are showing up in the slide, like I see that there was about 55 GB of data per hour. Uh, do you have uh, any decoupling uh, infra in place like uh, compute and the storage? So frankly speaking, the concept of storage still remains same, kind of uh, the on-premise thing, Although it on on the on prem we primarily did on AWS, so we were using S3 for in the same in the same region. So we started our M4X in North Virginia region, and we were using the buckets within that same region to basically have that real time kind of a reading and writing. So we were using that. Along with that, the other things which are available is uh, the machines which are on the on prem. There you have uh, you have to mount uh, more disk. So the way you do in any normal system. So you have to mount disk, or you go ahead and uh, have a configuration of NAS. That will also help for uh, for this kind of thing. So, storage-wise, we there is nothing like a kind of uh, improvement in terms of uh, this thing because it's just that initially also we were using S3 for our jobs or uh, GCS for our jobs, and we just converted that uh, as it is to to this. So, optimization on the storage part is kind of uh, and anyways the data size is as it is, right? So, storage will remain same. Same same concepts apply if I say that I want to have an on-prem cluster. It's just that you, you had changed the interface on top of it, you have a DCOS. Whatever operations you have to do, if your hardware is good, it will the, your cluster will behave good, it will be fast. If it is not that good, I mean lower side, lower in terms of the, in the commodity hardware uh, region as well, if it is on the lower side, your cluster will not behave well. So those conditions apply. Uh, so Apnil, I think you've shown us a great demo. Uh, it's really amazing. Uh, I'm assuming that you have the underlying OS also. Yes. On the nodes. Yes. Right. But no uh, virtualization. It's the bare OS that you're using. Yes, it is the bare machines. Uh, any containers or dockers that you're using so, in addition to your DCU? Yes. So if you talk about Google com computing, so uh, uh, when we when we have this on GCS, uh, GCP, so in GCP we don't have machines. It's it's the VM. So uh, a machine, uh, a VM, is is also going to work. So after all, your machine is also a pool of resources. Either it is a VM or it is a bare metal machine, it's, it's okay. Uh, so you've shown it without the GCP, right? Yes, this was without GCP. Without GCP. Yes. So you can use the bare OS and on top of that you can use the DCOS. Exactly, we can. Okay. There, there is no restriction in terms of the type of operating system and all, so that is all out. Is there any optimization you visualize between the DCOS and OS? Because no, no, no. You have two no, OSs. No, no, no. Nothing, nothing as such. It's more of, uh, so we talked about having a master and we talked about having five slaves for it. Uh, they have to kind of work in a closed environment. Uh, all the basic uh, rules and regulations apply because that was Ansible script. So you have to define your pr private network and you have to hide it behind the load balancers and all, all those things apply. So it's just that those scripts, you, you the basic requirement is you need to have a cluster. And on one of the nodes, the master daemon of the DCOS will run on, and in the other ones, the slave daemons will run. They have basic requirements of connecting. If we make sure that happens, we are good. Um, question here. So you mentioned that the nodes that you created, they're all of the same type. Pardon? The nodes that you created, they're all of the same type or yep. instance. Yep. Is it possible to create different types of instances and yes. have certain applications only run on certain types of nodes? Is there so, some kind of application affinity to the nodes that can be defined? Got so the type of machine going inside your infrastructure is a part of your Ansible script. DCOS has no role to play in that, right? So the script which I just initially, the cloud formation template I use as it is, there if you want to have multiple types of machine getting uh, added as in, in a cluster, you can have that. So it is that level of configuration. Now selecting a machine, so let's say if I want to fire a normal Java application and that Java application can only be executed on maybe on any machines available in the cluster, we cannot predict that kind of a thing. But if I have a requirement, uh, and if I have just five machines which require GPU, we can 
guide those uh, applications to uh, get spawned on the other yeah, one. Because in the configuration file, you mentioned CPU, memory. So exactly. I was wondering if there is a node affinity that can be added. Uh, resource allocation policy where you can specify which node uh, or which class of nodes to run on. You don't have anything uh, yet on that. So I think uh, I'm not very sure about that, frankly, because it's kind of more of GPU side, GPU side we had tested and this and okay. that. And we had moved Spark. So once I have that knowledge of uh, effectively utilizing, because we are using Kubeflow to do that, uh, then I would be in a better state to answer. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Swapnil. Yeah. I think there is one more question. Okay, let's discuss. You can take the question offline with it. 